Good morning, friends. We are called by many voices, but this morning we respond to the voice of the one who made us and who makes us one people. Together, let us raise our voices in prayer and praise, and let us worship the Lord. It says go straight to the hymn. But before we get there, may the peace of Christ be with you. <laughs> and also with you. Welcome to all of you to the United Church of Fayetteville, whether you are here in person or online. And once again, friends, we are called by many voices, but this morning we respond to the voice of the one who made us and one who makes us one people. Therefore, together, let us raise our voices in prayer and praise and let us worship the Lord.
Please join me in prayer. Wondrous God, you have created humans in your image, splendid in diversity, varied in gifts, and rich with opportunity. For the days of our lives and the possibilities that come with each dawn and each new encounter, please accept our praise now and forevermore. Amen. People of God, we who are created in God's image need to be restored to the possibilities of our creation. So let us turn to God in confession. Merciful God, you have given us gifts, but we don't always attend to their care. You have given us talents, but our appreciation is often lost in our envy of others. You have given us ability and opportunity, but too often we use them only for our own good and not in the service of all your people. Forgive us. Restore in us discerning spirits and generous hearts so that we might use all that we have for our enjoyment and the world's good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, the good news is this. Through our forgiveness in Christ, we are restored to our created goodness and equipped to live joyful and faithful lives. Having been reconciled with God, let us extend that grace to one another. Yeah. Now it says the peace of Christ. Um, we'll get let us make our... That's on page three. Let us... Let us make our offerings to the Lord in good cheer and with a faithful heart.
bountiful God, you are present in the blessings of our lives, the work of our hands, hearts, and minds, in our security and in our hope, in our treasure, and in our talent. We make our offerings this day, pledging to use all of these gifts fully and joyfully in your name. May all that we do and give be pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And before I read our scriptures, our thanks to Steve. For the second time in three weeks, he stepped in at the last minute to replace a liturgist, and I didn't know he was doing it today, so he did not get his script until the last minute. Let us turn our thoughts and minds to the Word of God. Our first reading today comes to us from the teacher known as Ecclesiastes. There is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also I saw from the hand of God. For apart from God, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases God, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. So wrote the teacher. Let us raise our voices in praise for God's enduring word. God's word to us continues this day from St. Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. Let us listen for Paul's words to them, and so to us. Paul wrote, And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. God always blesses the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and especially the living of the Holy Word. Please join me in prayer. God of gift and call, breath, and life. We pray for your spirit this day, that we might find the words of our faith planted anew in our hearts, minds, and souls, for refreshed living in our own time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Labor Day is a unique holiday among our nation's or even the world's holidays. It honors no person, no battle, no national or international event. Rather, it seeks to attend to something that forms the infrastructure of all of our lives, the ways we make a living, the things we do with our hands, the creativity of our minds, the sweat of our brows. Labor Day literally celebrates the acts with which we spend our lives and those who perform them well. Given that all the days of our lives are given to us by God, then it seems appropriate on Labor Day to faithfully reflect on the worth, work that fills them. When I first contemplated this Sunday service, it seemed a straightforward affair, but the longer I thought about it, the more complex it got. I wonder if I were to take a survey today, who would respond, we have jobs, we are unemployed, we are parents, we are studying for a particular occupation, 
have a career, are retired, are volunteers, caregivers, have a hobby or a ministry which lights our passions? I don't know. And most of us probably have three or four of those things on our list. Another question is how many of us enjoy what we are doing? How many feel trapped by necessity or golden handcuffs? How many wish we were doing something else if practical matters weren't in the forefront of our considerations? For how many unemployed or between employment or now retired or with an empty nest? Is there a lack of structure or do we experience a lack of dignity, a lack of meaning that causes some kind of spiritual ache? If we find ourselves in any of those circumstances, and most of us do at one time or another, hardened by a stressful job or no job, work that brings no joy. If we find ourselves defined or undefined by our work, then perhaps it's time to listen for the discerning spirit of God. Before we do that, though, I'd like to explore the idea of vocation for a few minutes. While a vocation is often assumed to refer to a religious occupation, or more tritely, to simply be another word for job, it, it, it has, in fact, a much richer meaning, even if the word itself is fairly simple. Vocation comes from the Latin vocare, which means to call out. I was once startled by a question in a Bible study I led here. Are you a pastor because you love God? I was startled because not because I don't love God, but because it had never occurred to me that loving God might be a distinguishing characteristic of those in religious service. I share this room each Sunday and stand as one among many religions, among millions of people around the world who love God although relatively few of them are professionally religious. And although this idea of vocation had been addressed earlier in history, the expansion of that idea of that image of vocation really got a workout during the Reformation. Curiously, the first discussion during the Reformation was a pastoral response to women. Among the institutions closed by reformers were convents. Until that time and for long after, the church offered the large majority of women the only access they would have to an education, to a degree of self-rule and independence, and to an ordering of their communal lives which was unavailable to them anywhere else. Leaders of the Reformation were sensitive to this, and they began speaking of the vocation of motherhood and wifery, of being responsible for the religious education of a family and maintaining a moral home. And yes, in many ways it was and still is stereotypical, and it would come back to bite not only women, but the entire culture about three centuries later, and that continues today. But in its time, for its valuing of the lives of women, it was a quite remarkable theology. The theology of vocation continued to expand to encompass all kinds of work, well and thoughtfully done, whether it was carpentry, parenting, governing, writing, cleaning, caring for the elderly, or painting. And while any thought theology poorly used can be used to discriminate or used to keep people in their place, whatever that phrase might mean, in fact, a true theology of vocation finds value in every place work, or service. Further, a theology of vocation calls us to be good stewards of all the gifts we have been given as individuals, gifts to be used for our enjoyment and to serve God's purposes in the world. To take our jobs and love them, whether they are, pay are paid or volunteer, the mutual obligation of family and community, or the solitary act of artistic creation, to grasp to enjoy fully our vocations requires the exercise of discernment for each one of us and some help from the community of friends, family, and church. In the Presbyterian church, one cannot be ordained until one can express a sense of personal call, until one has received a call from an appropriate organization like a congregation because the denomination requires that someone 
advocate the recognition of those gifts in the individual. It's individual, it's a conversation with God, and it's a conversation with the community, as it is for all of us. First, we assess what our gifts are, gifts that may change, grow, fade, or flourish anew over the years. We listen to our own hearts. God speaks to us in our hearts, inviting us to pay attention to what gives us energy, to what calls us to passionate response, to what gives us quiet joy. Then we tune in to the community around us. What gifts in us does it verify? What gifts does it need from us? In what way has God equipped us to be a part of something bigger than ourselves? When we listen, no two of us will find the same answers, even among those of us who share the same household, the same occupations, or the same stage in life. For each of us, the joys, the experiences, the burdens, the goals, and the symbols of what we do with our days are different. One teacher opens minds, one does justice, one serves the poor. One medical professional heals bodies, another nourishes people, another souls, other tends, others tend to families, guide rehab, or teach people to live within their limits. One parent may foster independence, another gifts, and another social skills and relationships. Created differently, each of us and every one of us, all of us together, have been created in God's image, each with these gifts and callings that will find different expression in each one of us. One way to do the listening or begin or deepen our experience of the spiritual element of our labors, that it might take a larger role in our lives, is to consider scripture and perhaps find a text that will resonate with us. It might be a text that mentions what we do. There are plenty of teachers, healers, lawyers, judges, parents, children, hunters, gatherers, scribes, and musicians in scripture. Even here in the land of the New York State Fair, however, relatively few of us are shepherds or dressers of sycamore trees. But there are certainly parallels with other occupations. Some of us may say it would be a stretch to find what I do in the Bible. Or perhaps there is no text about my occupation that really speaks to the way I feel about what I do. Then is the time to listen for a story that has long been one that is, has intrigued you or is a favorite of yours or you find yourselves drawn to in scripture. It is my guess, for example, that IT folk would be hard pressed to find a direct parallel in scripture to what they do. Yet talking to a number of folk whose work is technology focused, they tell me that they experience a resonance, Bill Gates notwithstanding, with the Genesis story of calling order from chaos. This is a time for each person to honestly consider their own gifts and how to employ them especially right now in the life of this congregation, as they can be used in the service of God through the community of faith that is UCF. Reflecting on personal gifts and offerings is different than thinking, I'd like to be on this committee, and, or different than saying, I know what UCF needs, as though one person might possess all the communal wisdom that there is here. It's different than saying, I should be in charge of this, or I should be the one to decide that. This is a time when listening to God and one another is far more important and more critical to the shape of UCF's future than talking about a vision crea created in isolation of our own homes or our own minds. Reflections on one's own gifts and the needs of the community is, as they say, not about you or not about me for that matter. It is listening to God and the vocational calling of the church for what it needs, whether that voice comes through the nominating committee or requests for assistance from the pulpit or the lectern in minutes for mission, other announcements or email communications. It is all about God and the service and the ways God has gifted each one of us for that service. Long before John Dung wrote the words, no man is an island, St. Paul knew and proclaimed that truth, that no one person is the church, only all of us together. 
as we come to the table this day to be fed with the most basic food of bread and cup. Let us share a prayer that in the blessing and praying, we may discover God's spirit flowing afresh in our lives, God's, wi God's wisdom guiding our choices, God's will for our enjoyment fulfilled, and God's purposes for the world carried out. Frederick Beekner famously wrote that a vocation is the place where our deep joy and the world's deep need meet. May each one of us discover or rediscover that place for ourselves in all the days ahead. Friends, let us all come to the table this day that we might be nourished in spirit, in generosity of self for the upbuilding of the community and let everyone be filled. Come to the table this day, everyone. Please join me in our prayer of preparation as we come to the table this day. The Lord be with you. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Most holy God, as it was so long ago, it is now. In the breaking of bread and the sharing of a meal in the eating and drinking. Memory restores hope, and our spirits are encouraged for what is to come. At this table, we lean toward tomorrow on the strength of the ancient promise that none of us will be lost. Today, may you gift us with courage, flexibility, and commitment to life together as your son's body in the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus sat at table with his disciples. And he took the bread, and giving thanks to God, he blessed it. And he broke it, and offered it there, as we, ministering in his name, offer it here saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the for, for the forgiveness of sins of many. As often as we eat this bread, and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he shall come again.
Let us continue to be in an attitude of prayer. Gracious God, we have come to this table this day, freshly aware of joys shared in our community, of needs named and unnamed, of health concerns. We have come to grateful for this community, for its power to uphold us and to serve the world. We pray that we have indeed been nourished in body and soul at this meal and are fit to go forth as your son's faithful disciples, as we so desire to be. Bless us and guide us and continue to gift us with your spirit as we go forth from this place. We pray all these things and the words that your son taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. now, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>